experts in the Postgres community, starting from my left, your, yeah, your left too, look at that. <laughs> my left, your left, uh, we have Mason Sharp, who is the original architect of Postgres Excel. Next to him, we have Petar Jelenic, who is the de who developed a Postgres-based platform for Skype while working at Microsoft. No joke. Uh, following him is Peter Eisentrout, uh, who contributed to Postgres, deve to the Postgres development as a core team member and committer since 1999. That's a lot of years ago. Uh, after him is Simon Riggs, the CTO of Second Quadrant, who's got 25 years as a database architect major developer and code committer of the Postgres core. After him, we have Jonathan Katz, CTO of VeniBook and managing director of Exco Ventures. Now I'm gonna ask, just to make this a little more personal, I'm gonna throw some, the very first question is not so Postgres focused, but it'll, it'll give like an insight on uh, the people we have up on our panel. So which person, starting with you, which person in the tech sector would you lo most like to meet and why? that also. I was going to say Larry Ellison as well, but I'm going to defer to my next best, which would actually be Gary Vaynerchuk, if anyone knows who he is. I think yes. him and I would probably drive well. Uh, all right, so the next question is, besides Postgres, what other databases do you have experience with and what and to what degree? And whoever's got the mic, you can start. Um, Simon. Okay. Um, well, uh, gray hair uh, kind of counts for a lot, so I... Uh, I was at one point certified on Oracle, um, certified on Teradata, and I've done some work, uh, some decent work with DB2 as well. So, you know, I've been fortunate enough to grow up in the open source era, um, but, you know, I, I've used MySQL. Um, you know, in college, I played with SQL Server and Oracle, um, played with MongoDB, Redis, you know, some of the, the newer, newer data storage systems as well. I, I mean, I've used Redis a lot in production too. I'm more like uh, with John and I actually joined on the end of the screen with any other data. This is all that's what for comparison's sake. Um, I learned about what a database was in college. I didn't have any idea what a database was. I learned you know, the course that you take and two weeks later on the <coughs> job in the Postgres DBA. And uh, I've been with that ever since, but the DB system, I, I guess I have some operational experience with, with Cassandra. And it was interesting as well, it came into Cassandra just sort of in the last couple of years after they sort of switched from their original sort of API to what I think they call CQL. So it's basically just looked like more or less data So it's, I don't know if there's been really a lot of experience with that. It's just that I think in source and updates are the same. Uh, so for me, yeah, I mostly work on search databases as well. I work quite a bit with my SQL before Postgres. Um, I have some experience, little experience with Oracle. I have quite a bit of experience with uh, Azure tables, which is a closed NoSQL database, and a little bit 
I guess for me that particular question kind of makes it sound like other databases are better and that we're playing catch up. Um, for me, I've spent for a long time adding features to Postgres, but my reason for being involved in the project was to add features that aren't available in other systems because there has been uh, a fairly chronic shortage of ideas and feedback from people using the product or using database products uh, feeding into how databases should look. So, you know, really my involvement in Postgres is, is not about taking features from other systems, it's taking the features that we actually need uh, from real world usage and putting those in the, in the database. Uh, and in, in quite a lot of cases those those features do not exist. They should exist if the other companies have been doing their jobs properly, but had they been doing it, I probably wouldn't be involved now. So it's uh, you know, a different viewpoint. <coughs> uh, so I'm gonna sound incredibly petty with my comments then after that. Um, but I'd like to see a better a native partitioning and sharding within Postgres. And you know, the nice thing about a project like Postgres Excel, it's, it's basically given a roadmap for how to do sharding. It does it very well. Um, additionally, I'd like to see better support for archived data. There's some extensions out there, such as uh, the C-Store of DW, that, that you know, I personally use to archive some of our information. But having you know, something you know, built into Postgres to really take advantage of all the compression and awesomeness of it would be great. I think the last but not least, and this is coming with the, the work on a logical replication, is um, better ways of restoring the data. Um, for instance, you know, right now to do a restore, the easiest way is to restore your entire cluster, but there's certain things you can do with PG Logical that make it easier to replicate over a single table, restore a single database, and you know, I'm excited to see all the work that's coming out of that. All right, and on that note, let's take it to the next step. The New, Year's, New Year is approaching, so what are your predictions for the future of Postgres? And that can be either a functionality roadmap or more general like market presence and market share. 
So, um, okay, so uh, I'll try to kick this one off. I'm really excited for Postgres 10 because it's, you know, there's a lot of new things coming with it. And, you know, some, the, the people on the panel can actually speak better to the specific features. But the fact that Postgres is going from like the 9 series to the 10 series, it's just been a remarkable step for the community. At Postgres 9, still a common question I know I received when talking to people in the tech community was, what's Postgres? Nowadays, it's like, oh, Postgres, yeah, of course we build our app on top of that. And just to see the community advance at this point is, has been really exciting. Um, what's, what's in store with Postgres 10 is, you know, you know, in addition to all the features, which again, they'll talk about, is like we even changing the naming scheme to, you know, to be like Postgres 10, Postgres 11, Postgres 12, and just advance, you know, even, even faster beyond that. Yeah, I think uh, the question was about market. Um, well, it, was, it was up to you. You can right. choose to about market or functionality. Um, well, you know, I, I'm going to present about functionality later, so I'll skip to the, uh, the market. I mean, the, the amazing thing for me is that um, we are seeing uh, a lot of adoption in Postgres, and uh, I, I can be honest, we are already more successful than I ever thought we would be. Uh, but that's because I didn't really give it much thought, to be honest. And uh, I think a couple of years ago, somebody said to me, uh, what, uh, what does success look like to you? And I thought about it for a while, and I said, Microsoft Postgres. Uh, and everybody laughed. And then last year, Microsoft produced a video about how to put Postgres on Azure. Uh, and it was just uh, a kind of, oh my god moment where I thought, oh, no, it's already happened. I thought it was going to be like 10 years away. And then, and then suddenly it's, it's already happened. So um, we just got back into the number four spot on DB engines uh, for database. And Postgres uh, is increasing and other things are decreasing. Uh, so I think there's uh, a lot of traction still to come uh, for us, a lot more success still to be had. Yeah, I think Postgres the product marches forward steadily. Um, you know, the kind of features we're working on now are in the application cluster, but I don't think we talked about this morning. But, but I'm interested in this sort of scaling the development and community processes. And I don't really have any good answers to that, so that's something I'll try to focus on next year probably. Um. So I will go with the features. Everybody else chose to skip them. Uh, what I find interesting is that, like we all said, something that Postgres should have, or what we would like Postgres to have in the previous version. And for me, the interesting part is that basically all of those things are being worked on. So that's the close future is that. Like the things that we should wish for this to have, it will have in a few weeks. Great answer. I think uh, we'll continue to see more um, Postgres and Postgres derivatives in the cloud and being able to manage them more easily. But Amazon just announced uh, Aurora for Postgres. Uh, I was at a Postgres conference in Shanghai about a month ago. And there are many um, different Chinese companies putting Postgres in the cloud and even customized versions of Postgres and trying to make it easier to manage. So I, I think we'll see more, maybe more versions of Postgres, maybe derivatives, uh, being able to use it easily in the cloud. What, what tools are your favorite or most useful for managing data? And what's in your toolkit every day that you think is something that you want to share with everybody? I, it seems like I always need a little more time to think of my answers. Uh, I, uh, in terms of managing data, uh, SQL, I guess. Yeah, I would explain it on the easy tool, which is the common line for the group. Right. Uh, yeah, I, that's basically what I use to, uh, I think, have a new report that uh, programming language. Easily write up a small database client is also useful, for example, like you can just pipeline you know, it when you do something that's a little more complicated. <coughs> but just being sort of having a, a 
template ready or you know, knowing how to basically type up a small database application in that way is useful. Thanks. Um, we can I answered this question the other day, so I'll give the same answer, which is PG Bench, uh, because it allows you to do quite complex modeling of your transactional workloads, and that's obviously, from my presentation, you can tell us that we're going to spend a lot of time trying to think about how we actually predict uh, what our systems are going to behave like when they're still at the drawing board stage. Um, uh, it's quite an important tool for that for me. So, you know, I, I feel very comfortable on the command line, so, you know, PSQL is my go-to day to day. Uh, but for some of the members of my team who are not as comfortable, uh, they use PG Admin. Uh, PG Admin is an open source tool, uh, version 4 is out. I think it runs both on the desktop and the web. And, you know, it, it handles basically, you know, basically encapsulates all the day-to-day the -day, uh, database management tasks that you can you know, handle. All right, the next question might make you all a little uncomfortable, so I'm gonna answer it myself, just to throw myself in the fire first. Um, what was your worst data management mistake ever, and then what you, what lessons learned have you to, uh, did you get from that, and what was the takeaway? And just to tell you all what I did, um, and this wasn't with Postgres, so, so feel free to um, ramp on it, but uh, basically, I went to drop a staging uh, staging server database, and it turns out I was using the GUI tool for the production server live on Friday at five o'clock. So I dropped the production server of the live server at Friday at five o'clock, and it took me a few minutes to even realize I did that because <coughs> the only reason I couldn't figure out why no, the, the only reason I figured that out was when I tried to restore the staging which had a system to do that. It didn't. It restored it to a blank server, so now I took out the staging and. Um, <laughs> so, so the moral of the story is the lessons learned is make sure if you give access to live production databases, which is anyway questionable, make sure your GUI tools look completely different. So that's my takeaway. So does that have to be a database in particular, or could it just be any given data? I guess any given data. Okay. So um, one time at three in the morning, um, I was I was trying to clean up our, our disk, you know, some some stuff on our shared disk, and we were hosting our payment application on the shared disk. And there was like a one-time key that was only available on that disk stored nowhere else. And I thought I was cleaning up our staging disk. It turns out I was cleaning up the production disk, deleted that one-time key on our payment application, which basically meant we couldn't process any payments. So basically frantically at like you know, 3.15, 3.30 in the morning trying to regenerate a new key. And basically, you know, it, you know, it all went off with no harm because we were a smaller company then. It was a different company and we were smaller. Payments weren't processing then, but people did notice and I did have to you know, hang my head in shame the next day. But Always, always the important lesson, like don't don't try to do any cleanup or anything outside the scope at 3.30 in the morning. <coughs> um, I'm embarrassed to have a choice of uh, <coughs> answers. Uh, <coughs> my, uh, my most embarrassing moment was when I typed uh, the name of one of our tables and I forgot to put the uh, suffix on the end of it. So I typed drop table customer and then hit enter, and uh, that didn't end well, as you can imagine. So, um, yeah, I, I learned from that that the moral of the story is to uh, uh, try not to use command lines, uh, write programs, and then test them, and then if they work, execute them in production. And always use transactions. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can support that. The biggest mess I, I guess I've made is that we were moving a, uh, an application from a single database system, single application from a single database to a shorter system, so there were a lot of changes which we had to pair, but our confidence was in this the code change we had to pair was basically just in us having found all the places as opposed to having to actually test it. So we spent a sort of following the sort of clean up that mess of production. And, uh, it, you know, that just annoyed basically the whole team who had to use that system. And, uh, the lesson I learned from that is basically use you know, test, write programs, test, use configuration automation, and uh, use staging systems. Like um, I kind of did all the before. <laughs> but uh, I guess in terms of like the first impact, but in terms of impact, was 
such a innocent thing as creative music, where whole uh, chat application used by human people at the same time was long for the mix. Can, can I throw you out a bit of bus so that means you took out Skype for 10 minutes? Yes. <laughs> 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 That's going to be hard to beat. <laughs> Similar to some of the others, I think I was migrating data, uh, and you know, t I tested in the test environment. Instead of writing a script, I sort of had the secret command, so I was copying and pasting, and then I think I forgot the last and of the where clause and updated some data, but it wasn't too bad. I, mean, I could get it from the backup server, and it's okay. Lesson learned. Uh, it's good to have. Uh, uh, back us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then, okay. What's your advice to people who are deciding which database to use for a new project? And obviously, this is going to be Postgres bias, but, but let's hear the pitch. Yeah, I think probably everyone will say something positive about uh, um, Postgres. Uh, but also, when, when developing, um, really think about, think about scalability. I know people also say, hey, just you know, code it and scale as you need. But think about scalability and think about the application using the database. Take, take time to data model properly and think about what will happen as it scales and for the application. Think about maybe in advance you want to already designate kind of along the lines with what Peter said a little bit, I think. Uh, connections for writes and connections for reads. If that's already baked into your uh, new application, then it's pretty easy to at least fairly painless to add read replicas later, um, things like that. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I don't think I agree with but uh, I actually think it's quite important to um, think about how you start the data, uh, what shape it will have. Uh, I mean, I know now what is popular to have the musical when you have where you don't really care if they're in the application, but uh, it seems that this is something as well into the writing. And so you actually need to know what, what data you are for and how you plan to store them. So you need to actually take them over data in front. That's quite important to me. <coughs> the way I like to think about it is if you, if you pick a product for, for some task, be it database or operating system or programming language, I like to pick something that I can use for other things also in the future, because if you want to be good at it, you've got to make a lesson and learn about it and spend your time on it. So you can probably for any task find a sort of a marginal niche product that's really good, but then it really only does exactly what you need to do right now, and if you need to do something else later or expand and that product is not going to work anymore. You have to pick a different product and then a different product, and you have a zoo of things in your stack. So I like to think if you pick sort of a maybe not as sexy product, but that has a sort of more universal uh, use cases, then that will get you further. So your Postgres is something like that, and you can use for transactional analytics, and it has uh, different plugins to do different things, and the same goes for operating systems or programming. Just to work for everything quite well, as opposed to having sort of performance sessions in each case, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I would like to add to that. Uh, I think that this is actually quite important because uh, if you choose something that's generally the most things, you can always optimize a specific use case later when you actually hit the program to generate the stuff. <coughs> well, my answer is Postgres, or Postgres. Um, but uh, to be clear, you know, I'm involved with Postgres because my answer is Postgres, not, not my answer is Postgres because I'm involved with it. Um, so I used to work as a database architect, and so I was involved in constructing uh, quite a lot of systems. And um, I think it's important when you design something that you should start off with uh, something that probably meets your needs. Uh, and if <coughs> it doesn't meet your needs, you can do something about 
politics. And if it really then still isn't the right thing, you can get off of it fairly easily at low cost. So um, starting with free software that is pretty feature rich and yet also very highly extensible, it's almost certain that we can solve your problem, but if you really can't, then you haven't spent any money. So you can at least go and solve the problem by you know, assuming that this medical product exists, but you, you haven't spent any money that you can then spend on the next system. So for those reasons, start with Postgres, and uh, hopefully we'll get to the stage one day where uh, nobody got sacked for choosing Postgres. <laughs> So, um, you know, when, when I look at anything that we're trying to bring into our technology stack, my, it comes down to trust. Do I trust that this is going to work in production? And then really all software has issues, but is there enough support around the software that we can get through the issues? And like, this is like ever so important in open source because you have, you know, a million libraries that might all do the same thing, like which is the one that, you know, I can trust to run. And this is even more, you know, paramount with your data. Like data is the most important thing in your application. I don't care what anyone says, like I will fight that one to the death. You want to make sure that if, you, if you're trying to write a one to your disk, that one gets to your disk. And this is something that the Postgres community has made more important than you know anything else, just that durability and stability of your data. And you know that's you know what I'll tell you. My younger days, like I used Postgres because it was cool it had a lot of cool features. It's easy to deal with decent times. But you know as I you know as I've gained more experience, it's come down to. I trust that if like my disk crashes, I can bring back up my Postgres instance and everything's written to the disk, it's you know, everything's working, it's not corrupt, you know, and you know that you know that's what I look for. And if I run into an issue, oh there's a great open source community that's here to help and there's also you know, vendors that offer you know various levels of support. So that's why I say Postgres because it's all about you know keeping your data safe. And under what circumstances would you recommend someone with a legacy project to migrate to Postgres? Um, so I, I haven't dealt as much with migrations, you know, except you know for earlier in my career. I, I've been in a great position. I can start with Postgres. Um, I will give a very cliche answer. I will say every project. Um, but I, I mean, I know there's certain cases where it not, might not make as much sense. So I will defer to the experts on this. Well, I guess. I would look at it in terms of business case. Uh, unfortunately, there's too many existing systems out there to migrate them all. So however much you might want to, uh, it's simply not practical. Uh, so you then need to focus on the ones that are going to cost you either time or money or both. Uh, so like an old system that's creaking at the seams or uh, one where the license uh, is about to expire and you're going to pay another 14 million uh, or however much you're going to get charged that time, those are damn good reasons to migrate. Um, but, you know, if it ain't broke, um, you know, Postgres is not the, uh, the fix you need. If it ain't broke, it doesn't need anything at all. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think in most cases it is, it is cost. So you have to think of the most case of the investment versus the money you pay out. And in, I guess in most cases it's obligations. <coughs> Many obligations don't live long enough to have that in consideration. But if they do live very long, then I guess they always do it for our And at some point, you've got to you know, make this decision probably at some point to remove your, your hardware. It's not, you can't remove your hardware to do something that really comes up. <coughs> yeah, I agree with the process, but I would love the process of uh, maintenance and good development of the application. If your current product is limiting you in something that you need to run, or if you are planning to do uh, some kind of rewrite for various reasons like performance, anyway, then why not go to the grid? Pretty much agree with everything said. Uh, I guess another consideration is your um, staff. If it's some legacy system and people are retiring, it's an older company, 
Uh, if no one understands it anymore, uh, maybe, maybe we should keep on migrating. Otherwise, yeah, Klaus. All right, what's your thoughts on hybrid systems that mix some kind of non-relational NoSQL database with Postgres? Some people would use like a Redis as a cache. Some people would literally use like Couchbase or Mongo as an object store in addition. What are your feelings to that? Is that a recipe for disaster or is that a wise strategy or somewhere in between? Yeah, I think it, when it makes sense to do, do pick the best tool for, for the job. Um, like at uh, Meet Me, I think that they, they employed a lot of caching that makes sense uh, to use. Uh, I, um, use Redis a little bit. It, it's it's great for what it does as a cache. So pick the best tool for the job. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Two for a job. Uh, which is one of the good use cases. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, Postgres is actually a mixed case or mixed mode system because it has uh, non-relational data that is open. Uh, you don't necessarily need the non-relational stuff, but especially for mixing. Yeah, the right tool for the right job is good. Uh, just don't, don't pick too many tools that I think is sort of beginning for there. It's just sort of too many choices, and they all you know, the, once you sort of break open, then yeah, I won't pick whatever tool you, you like. You still have to get an organization to kind of still have to keep sort of cap on the, how many different experiments you do at the same time, but that's the only uh, concern. Because then you have every experiment has the chance to actually become a production system implicitly, right? So then at the end, you just have the two new things to, to maintain and manage that just it's the default and find the right one. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, just to echo what Peter just said, um, I do see uh, systems that have got basically too many moving parts in them and uh, you know it's not surprising that people get problems with uh, view consistency amongst all the moving parts you know if you've got like a, a data warehouse a content server a cache server <coughs> an index server and then, you know some other bits in there as well and it's starting to look so complex that the chance of it breaking uh, goes up considerably um, and you also get a lot of problems with integration of components where one bit of software only works with you know, version 5.3 and above and, and then another component only works with 5.2 and below and then you end up with sort of that there isn't any supported configuration of all of the different components. Um, so I, I would say minimize the number of working parts if you want it to actually work moving fast. Yeah, so um, just to just, just add on to all that. So yeah, hybrid, hybrid solutions I'm a fan of. We, and we have something similar in many of them. Um, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about like where you know, Postgres is going though in this case. You know, what, one of the most powerful caching strategies is the, the data-driven cache validation and invalidation because instead of saying time expirations on your cache, you can basically say, oh, this data is updated, you know, expire all these you know, various keys. And, Essentially, keep things cached you know, forever, you know, especially you know high you know, high performance applications. What's beautiful about like the logical replication, particularly the logical decoding, is that you know instead of trying to write some messy triggers or you know some other things that you know, might be a little bit harder for developers to keep track of, you can essentially you know read your logical replication stream and say, oh, you know these things in this you know this row has expired in this table, you know let me federate it out to all my various caches. Basically, build up like this very robust and you know, it's very simple, you know, caching, uh, cache expiration mechanism, and you know, make caching you know, less of a problem within your um, your infrastructure. Right, you've all amassed a lot of wisdom in your careers. What would be your best takeaway advice to someone who's getting into data or wants to become a data techie of some sorts? You just share lifelong wisdom and summed up in a couple sentences. Oof. Well, I always like to say, data is hard. <coughs> There's just a lot to it, you know, they're structured, unstructured, whatever it might be. There's, you know, literally there is a lot of information in it. I just like to say, don't give up, you know, keep trying to learn it, learn, learn how to analyze it, learn how to query it, learn how to architect it, learn how to, how to manage it. I mean, 
to me, I think it's like one of the most beautiful things available in computer science. Like, and that's a word that I don't want to use lightly. So keep at, keep at that data. Uh, I guess it would have to be data quality, really, because uh, too many times I see people set up a database and then they don't really realise that the users kind of go through the app just going 999, tab, tab, AAA, 999, tab, tab, and then they look through their data and wonder why it's rubbish. And, um, you know, we, we get to a lot of trouble to set up complex databases, but there's no point unless you are able to uh, capture useful data. Um, you know, there's just no point. Hmm. Um, it, it is hard, I mean, it's, it's scary at times, I guess you, you have to uh, deal with that perhaps, you know, this, this, if you work on, on application programming and it doesn't work, you, you can throw it away and try again or something like that, but working with data that uh, people can't get to the data or the data is gone, that's very, that's very different, different problem. So, you have to have a certain develop a certain mindset and the sort of grumpy DBA stereotype is probably actually a true more reasonable to a certain extent. So it, it does take sort of a, 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 a sort of a slightly different approach to than just other people. Yeah, so people said they like hard, I agree. Uh, I think that because data is hard, it's quite easy to get caught on somebody who is trying to sell you an easy way out. And it's quite easy to uh, like believe that and then uh, you might be hurt by that eventually. So um, like I would say uh, that's really everything. Uh, if somebody doesn't tell you to either way of how it usually has a pretty big data area. And so we need to think about the data. So somewhat related to this last point is the open source world. Every other day there's some new database project. Um, don't, uh, I guess, pro I would approach all these cautiously uh, if you're entrusting your pr production data to this system, you know, maybe it's better to start out with something that's been proven and, and try to add out if it meets your needs, if you're out of way, uh, if it does. Um, for some of these newer databases, uh, yeah, I guess I would approach them cautiously and do a lot of testing and make sure you've exhausted other avenues. Uh, and this is uh, before you, you consider it to address some pain point. We have time for a couple audience questions. Does anyone want to throw a question? <coughs> yes. I thought about putting any graph uh, database capabilities in the book for us. That's the thing that was missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Um, uh, we already support recursive queries uh, in SQL, which is getting some way towards it, but uh, I think we need to, to go more. Um, personally, I'd like to support lots and lots of different use cases in the database. Um, the only danger when we do that is that we only give a little bit of lip service to the particular use case. If we support it, we should go fully in on that use case. Um, so, but I see no reason why we can't support lots of different use cases in the database at the same time. And that's actually one of the reasons people like Postgres, because we're supporting GIS at the same time as relational, at the same time as non-relational. Um, yep, keep going. <laughs> yes, on the back. So, um, add a lot of features, what would you just like to remove and help people stop using this? <laughs> what we would like to remove? There's a lot of small things I think that could be removed. Uh, I, think the, I have a patch at home which I haven't finished quite yet, but that was 2009, which is although we lost functionality at all. So the, the, <laughs> the 
the code base could be cleaned up. Um, the removing features, there's probably a lot of minor features that you could argue nobody uses, but it's just sort of the, 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 the effort to go and argue that usually outweighs the, the gain from it. But I think for me, it would be the code thing I just would be really good. Um, Rick, where did your code file? And this being removed in Postgres 10, I think? So this might seem like this might seem like a small one, but the money type, because the money type does nothing. And people ask me like, oh, I need to store money. Should I use the money type? And the answer when I when I first asked that, it was like, hell no, stay away from it. <laughs> um, and of course, money is one of those things that you cannot mess up in your database. So just let me go. So easy with money. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, he knows I'm working on the recovery.com thing, so. That's a low blow. <laughs> um, I, know, uh, the, I suppose what I find is uh, actually that um, the software works because it evolved to work. And I'm always reticent to remove things because there's so many unintended consequences that you tend to kind of remove that thing that you thought wasn't necessary and then five minutes later you're running around going, damn, where did that thing go? And so I am much more reticent to remove anything at all apart from rules. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean mostly things can always stand to be improved but once you've removed the big feature, it's uh, the unintended consequences tend to uh, overwhelm you. I just thought of something that kind of goes with code. I would like to do maybe like 25% of all funny versions that I think it's that I would like to do with the boss. Yeah, I'm going to ask Next question. Do I see hands going up? Anybody? Uh, how about here? So, your experience, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what are the learning curve challenges if you're a competent Postgres DBA? So the learning experience is moving from Postgres to Postgres Excel. Right, exactly. Yeah. What is the learning curve challenge that you have seen? Well, you okay with me on that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It will take more moving parts, um, and uh, you know there there aren't things like automatic failover. However, you could argue Postgres itself doesn't have automatic failover. It allows you to replicate instances. In case of Postgres Excel, you can have to replicate individual data nodes. So the day-to-day -day management piece, uh, if availability is really important uh, to you, uh, dealing with backups, uh, just that there are multiple instances, how to manage all of that. Um, yes, it's it's uh, it's a lot more complex. Well, I think to be honest. Uh, uh, like any cluster database or any multi node database will be always quite a bit more complex than single one. Yeah, I think the, uh, the difference between getting it right and getting it wrong is fairly small on Postgres and it gets bigger on a distributed system. So when you get it right, it works nicely, and when you get it wrong, it kind of like stops altogether. So, um, you know, it, it does require you to have a kind of higher level of knowledge about how the database works uh, in order to, well, I mean, obviously if you design your app and then it just works, then you don't need to do anything else, but systems tend to evolve, right? So that means you, you need to, uh, more understanding of physical design. Uh, yes. You're talking about Postgres or Aurora database, right? Yeah. <coughs> well, um, it's kind of a non sequitur really because it's not Postgres, um, so it's kind of um, yeah, it's not Postgres. So it, it might 
look and smell a bit like Postgres, but there will be restrictions. And if you program into that, then you'll end up not being able to migrate to anything else. So, you know, long-term advice in such things is keep it open and you won't fall foul of that problem. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, have you done a formal review of Microsoft, the, the 2016 release, and what did any of their claims about the kind of the massive improvements they're claiming, um, specifically related to things like Encounter and other types of uh, improvements they put in 2016? Well, uh, you know, obviously, um, there's a couple of things. Microsoft's got quite a nice marketing department, and most cases doesn't tend to have one. Um, you know, when they publish uh, a performance number that they've got some huge gain in performance, what that always means is one of the operations we measured ran that much faster. But which one that was, and whether that represents any significant percentage of your workload is a, is a different situation. Um, you know, the, uh, whether the things that they have are things that nobody else can have, uh, I, I doubt. And there's uh, a lot of the things that we've done in recent years with Postgres has been fine tuning Postgres to particular hardware, uh, and the hardware is getting more and more um, susceptible to such improvements. Whereas in the past we could write code that was just algorithmically correct. Now we have to be uh, careful about cache line alignment and uh, you know a, a dozen other <coughs> factors. So those performance gains are there for everybody else to have as well. So yeah. yes, here I have a question. To be fair, the Postgres press release sometimes contain sort of wild performance numbers as well. The difference in that case is that you can go to the public email list and at least see how those numbers were derived. Who was testing and who was providing the number, and what the consensus process was to put that number in the final release. So you have to obviously communicate somehow in simple terms with people, uh, but at least as long as you transfer the, how you got to that number, that's a big advantage. So I, um, I'm new to Postgres. Uh, so I have a question about <coughs> metadata repository, data about data. What would be the best tool? You managing data, data no, no, just documenting or uh, documented metadata. Documenting the metadata, yeah. Uh, this is a couple of Yeah, the, his question was what, what would be a good tool to document, manage or document the metadata of the Postgres. There are a couple of simple tools that some people like to use that sort of extracts schema and produce sort of nice documents out of the Postgres or other documents, one of them, and there might be a few other that works in one that just extract schemas and then comments and then build, um, so build report yeah. and build rapport and then have a little chart out of that's what I mean, that's more sophisticated than that. Tricks. Like, you know, sometimes even if you're doing like a select like existence type query, just adding a limit one will tell the query planner, like, oh no, I really only need to return one row. Like, there's a, I mean, there's a bunch of talks uh, from Postgres community members out there, like the little like tips and tricks in SQL to write faster queries. Um, I find, you know, beyond just adding an index, also researching the type of index that makes sense for your data type. For instance, uh, gin, gin indexes will return things really, really fast. Did you know that uh, you can uh, use a gene index on your integer array queries? So if you can find a way to like encapsulate your data in an integer array and then uh, take advantage of the gene index and like lightning fast and things up, I mean, that's great. I mean, that takes a little bit of creativity and it also depends on your data set, but you know, there, you know, with the advanced indexing that Postgres has, there are you know, sorts of those uh, little tricks and features you can utilize. Yeah, I would say physical design uh, improves things typically a lot more than just adding indexes. Um, so you need to be uh, flexible about the way you approach that. 
Uh, the other thing is that Postgres provides uh, three or four different ways of denormalizing data uh, in, in, in useful ways. Uh, and it depends what the data is like, obviously, but um, you know, frequently you can come up with um, physical designs that are enormously quicker without really losing anything at all in the application. I have a, perhaps a go to the question surprise and trick is that PLPGS well functions are often faster than plain SQL well functions, which might not make much sense because then PLPGS well is sort of generally more complicated, but because of the implicit query planning, planning caching that goes on, it's, uh, if you just take the exact same source code and put it in the PLPGS well function, it can sometimes be quite faster. Some tricky, but I mean, it's not a tricky, but uh, you said adding indexes, and uh, sometimes quite a lot of things are removing indexes. Since, like, uh, I often see databases that have tons and tons of indexes, and only a few of them are actually used, and then removing them improves the bright performance quite I've, I've also seen that, by the way. Um, using table inheritance and uh, doing table partitioning so that your queries, instead of we'll look at a much smaller subset of data if you have the appropriate workflows. All right, we have time for just one more question. Do you have your hand on it, Yeah, um, you touched a little bit on the development that's going on on the database partitioning. So when are we going to have a robust partitioning process? Um, well, this is a, an interesting discussion point because people quite often ask for exactly that and it, it does depend on what you exactly want because we already have a thing called the Brin index which excludes data from your scan very effectively uh, but because the word is not partition index people don't realise it exists and they don't use it um, so uh, if if you're using partitioning as a way of reducing the I.O. on a large scan, then that will help you. Um, we do already have a uh, constraint exclusion, which is a bit like partitioning, but uh, as a lot of well-educated people would point out, it doesn't do all of the things you want it to do. So the problem is when people say, I want proper partitioning, they kind of really want like one of the features that it does and it's quite difficult for us to work out exactly which one people mean and typically it's the optimization they want uh, but the problem is when it comes through to a lot of people what gets heard is I'd love this partitioning syntax and the problem then is we fuss about trying to provide the syntax and then forget about the optimization. Yeah? So you've already got constraint exclusion and brain indexes, both of which do uh, address the main use case, but not in every sense of the optimization. So uh, we are working on partitioning, and Thomas at the back there is uh, reviewing uh, a patch on partitioning for Postgres 10. And it may well get into Postgres 10, but Will it do every single thing that you want from partitioning? And I can't answer that because it's quite difficult to know exactly which optimization of the many you're particularly looking for. So. great example because I'm pretty certain that 90% of the people in the room didn't realise that that was the particular optimization that you would be wanting from it. Uh, I, anybody on the panel think that he, he meant that? No. So that, I would call that feature incremental backup and we're working on that as well but 
you know, it's, um, it's, it's part of the confusion of uh, when, you, when people explain their requirements in terms of a particular feature that another database supports, we don't, we don't always understand what that is and we sometimes get it wrong. Uh, and also what happens frequently is we do already support something like it, but uh, not using the same term that we're used to. That's all the time we have for this panel. I want to give a great big thank you to Jonathan, Simon, Peter, Penta, and Mason. Thank you.